Good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to see you um, for this um, look at the lithographs here on the walls, the 24 lithographs of the Exodus series by Marc Chagall. Um, as I was thinking about how to do this, it occurred to me that these lithographs are to some degree distant from you. Uh, I had originally thought that maybe we would face this way so that you could look to your left and look to your right, but it occurred to me that that's probably better for us to just face this wall. And when I talk about the specific uh, pictures, I'm going to uh, focus on these and a few to the right. Those behind us I will not look at because um, probably be a little painful for me to watch all of you try to turn around and to see what's going on in the back but lots of great things and maybe maybe next week for part two I'll have us facing this way so we can take a look at that as well what I want to do is um, try to open up Marc Chagall's perspective what his emphases are, and how those emphases become uh, concrete in these particular lithographs. I also want to talk a little bit about the lithograph process itself. Um, I'm hoping there will be time for questions and comments. I'm sure many of you know Marc Chagall, and, and undoubtedly several of you know Marc Chagall a lot better than I do. But um, whenever I am offered an opportunity to speak about something, especially something I know very little about, I first uh, engage in some serious trepidation. Then I say, yes, I'm going to do it. Because uh, those of you who have taught before know that the best way to learn something is to teach it to others because you have to really bone up on the topic. You have to anticipate the pathways that the topic opens up. You have to think about what are the questions that might be asked and how those questions, uh, again, give us better purchase on the, on the topic. So teaching is learning. I've learned a lot in uh, trying to prepare for today, and I look forward to some of your thoughts about these things as well. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a variety of topics, then we're going to turn to several of these lithographs and try to see how the various perspectives of Marc Chagall are illustrated here. So the first thing I want to do is a very brief biographical sketch. I'm only going to talk about his childhood. My point here is not so much to give us a panorama of his life, but to try to see where some of the important uh, moments are for him in terms of how he develops his perspective. So Marc Chagall was born on July 7, 1887 in Vitebsk in uh, Belarus, which is due north of Ukraine, with Lithuania on its left, on its west, and Russia on its east. Uh, he was born into a large Jewish family. Uh, Vitebsk itself had a population of about 66,000 people, of which little more than half were Jewish. And this is very, very important because Chagall embraces, of course, a perspective from a Jewish traditional point of view, but he's also a universalist and wants to talk about the human condition and human possibilities as well. And this, I think, will help us to understand some of the more perplexing aspects of his work. Uh, for example, uh, the horns on Moses' head, featured in several of these lithographs. Uh, also, uh, his portrait of Jesus, uh, the crucified Jesus. Uh, this has something to do with 
how he wants to understand humanity and not just the Jewish tradition. Vitebsk was a center of Orthodox Judaism, which combined, given that Lithuania was on its west, the Lithuanian scholarship, Jewish scholarship tradition, and also the impact of Chabad Hasidism. Okay, let me define briefly Hasidism. Hasidism is a simple democratic Judaism, simple democratic Judaism, based on an emotional faith rather than scholarship, which tends toward elitism. It tends away from formal observance in law and ritual and features the desire for communion with God through fervent prayer and joy. So Chagall really is in some way the inheritor of this Lithuanian scholarship tradition as well as the Hasidic tradition of trying to live lives of joy through one's emotions. Chagall went to Cheder as did most of the Jewish children in Vitebsk. And he does tell us that at some point his mother sent him to study the Bible with a uh, esteemed local rabbi. I want to now quote Chagall on the Bible. He says, ever since early childhood, I've been captivated by the Bible. It has always seemed to me and still seems today the greatest source of poetry imaginable. Ever since then, I have sought its reflection in life and in art. The Bible is like an echo of nature. And this is the secret I have tried to convey. I like that phrase, echo of nature. I'm not sure I understand exactly what he means. He may mean the way things are in a deeper sense, perhaps that transcends the particular traditions of particular people. Again, perhaps an intimation of his concern with universal themes as well as Jewish themes. According to one commentator, two sources dominated Chagall's work. I've already mentioned one, I'll repeat it. Members of the, of the Jewish, uh, uh, mem memories of the Jewish life and folklore of his early years in Russia. We'll wanna keep in mind this notion of memory and how he's gonna bring forward some of those early life memories where he was raised in a Hasidic family with its emphasis on simple piety and joy, fully expressed through singing and dancing. In an open letter later to his townspeople of Vitebsk, which was written in 1944, Chagall states, and I quote, I did not have one single painting that didn't breathe with your spirit and reflection, I'm gonna read that again, to his fellow citizens of Batesk. I didn't have one single painting that didn't breathe with your spirit and reflection, okay? Art, again, as memory. And he also wrote that not only my hands with their colors would direct me in my work, but the poor hands of my parents and others, and still others with their mute lips and their closed eyes, who gathered and whispered behind me, they would direct me as if they also wished to take part in my life and my life's work. Don't you just love that? But the poor hands of my parents and of others and still others with their mute lips and their closed eyes who gathered and whispered behind me 
I take it by what, what he means by this is, as I was doing my work, this would direct me. As if these people with mute lips and closed eyes wanted to take part in my work. And in my work, I bring them and their memory in. I want to uh, now say something about lithography, and I'm going to quote again from one author. So Chagall's real beginnings in lithography date from 1939. Something, something would have been lacking in my life, he said, if in addition to my passion for color, I had not at a certain stage have become involved with engraving and lithography. From my earliest days, when I first held a pencil in my hand, I've been seeking for that certain something that could flow forth like a mighty river towards a distant and inviting set of shores. Each time I held a lithographic stone or a copper plate in my hands, I felt that I was touching a talisman, something, a magic figure, something of magic power. I want to go back uh, here. Each time I held a lithographic stone or a copper plate in my hands, I felt that I was touching a talisman to which I could entrust all of my sorrows and all of my joys, everything in fact, that has marked my life, birth, death, marriage, flowers, animals, birds, poor workers, parents, lovers in the night, the prophets of the Bible, life in the street, the house, the church, and in the heavens, and with age, the tragedy of our own lives and of those around us. When I hold these tools in my hands, I'm conscious of the difference between lithography and engraving and drawing. You may be able to draw quite well, but if you don't feel lithography in the nerve endings of your fingers, that is a matter of the senses and not of ability. Each stroke must be redolent of the special state of mind, which has nothing to do with expertise or with technical skill. I want to read his comment or a comment on color. For many artists, monumental art finds expression through geometrical imperatives, structure. But Chagall has another conception of it as the story of the slow evolution of an inner world. It calls for great daring to break with geometrical precision and to rely solely on the power and intensity of color to achieve harmonious fluidity. The book of Exodus can be read in a variety of ways. As a portrait of the God of heaven and earth who prevails over opposing forces on behalf of the Israelites and by implication the, uh, in the oppressed of the world, you can read it as a story of larger-than-life heroes, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, Joshua, who rise to the challenges placed before them to lead the people out of one danger after another on their journey through the wilderness toward the Promised Land. You can read the book of Exodus as a study of the power of villainy the monstrous Pharaoh and the predatory Amalekites who attack the Israelites in their moment of greatest vulnerability, and the dire consequences that befall the villain. You can read it as a study of human weakness, the desire for instant gratification, 
and the ever-present need to worship the tangible and the finite, illustrated by the adoration of the golden calf. You can read it as an exploration of the foundations of a durable community, the kinds of doctrines, the institutions, the rituals, and the leaders necessary for stability, for high ethical and spiritual achievement, and survival. Whatever the perspective, one thing is certain. The book of Exodus contains some of the most faithful and memorable episodes in the entire Bible. Mark Chagall's Exodus, presented here in 24 lithographs, does not focus on the doctrinal, on the institutional, nor on the cosmic. His Exodus is the story of a people. And of course, as I've already suggested to you, his experience with the people uh, uh, pre uh, creates for him an impact uh, in terms of his emphasis. The story, his exodus, is the story of a people of the masses whom Chagall evidently admires and loves and of the passionately devoted and deeply human leaders who feel the spark of the divine and willingly and reverently participate in the process they cannot fully understand. I like that as well. The sense of mystery that Chagall elicits as well as celebrating the people. Let's, uh, let's uh, take a look now at some of the uh, lithographs themselves. So what I want to do is um, walk over and, uh, and look at them. So the first thing I want to say is something by way of an overview. They're arrayed here in the museum in the chronological order in which they occur in the book of uh, Exodus. I think there's one uh, non-sequential uh, accuracy at the beginning. What's interesting, I think, is that it, once we get to one of the central motifs of the book of Exodus, and that is the Pharaoh and the persecution, which begins right away in the book of Exodus in chapter 1 and goes all the way through chapter 14 when the Israelites have finally passed through the Red Sea on dry land. There are 40 chapters in the book of Exodus, 15 of the 40 deal with the persecution and finally liberation. Chagall has uh, illustrated nothing from chapter 5, verse 2 to chapter 10, verse 21. All of the plagues that were initiated by God and mediated by by Moses, except for one, the plague of darkness, which occurs over there. Uh, it's uh, 369, number, number nine. So this, I think, is something of a clue to Chagall's emphasis. He's not interested in villainy. He's not interested in the evil that those human beings were, uh, were uh, reported to have perpetrated but he's rather interested in something, I would say, sunnier, something lighter, something more humane, if you will. So let's, uh, let's take a look um, at some of these uh, lithographs, if you'll follow me here. So we've talked a little bit about Chagall's uh, interest in color. I do have a couple of quotes on color, which I can read a little bit later, that color is a product of light, and light is the mother of color. What we have here in this um, 13th lithograph, which is um, Moses commissioning Joshua, his uh, assistant, to defeat the Amalekites. Here's the biblical quote. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim, 
And Moses said to Joshua, choose us our men and go fight with Amalek. Now, you, you may know that the Amalekites, Amalek, has become a kind of prototype, an actual set of episodes in the Bible for the enemy par excellence against the Jews down through history, right? And although we read about uh, the Amalekites attacking the Israelites from the rear in the book of Exodus, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 25, I think, which we also read on the Shabbat before Purim, where God commands the Jews to wipe out Amalek from the earth. There will never be a time when you are not going to try to wipe out Amalek. So not only a a particular group, but a symbol of a group, and the Jewish people have called our enemies, including Adolf Hitler, as the Amalekite of this day. So the Amalekites are, are symbols of evil in the world. And one of the manifestations of that evil was that in the book of Exodus, they are alleged to have attacked the escaping Israelites from the rear, the weakest components of a community, of the entire community. This picture does intimate, it seems to me, in some way, the intensity of this situation, but it doesn't picture the Amalekites at all. What we have here is Moses commissioning Joshua. The intensity, unsurprisingly, comes from the color, Moses' garb, and Moses' face. So we do see that this is a moment of, uh, of horror in a way, but the enemy is not pictured at all, but just Moses laying his hands on Joshua in order to proceed with the... Uh, with the assault. What we have here in the next one, here is from Exodus chapter 19, where the Torah says, Moses then came and called for the elders of the people and proposed unto them all these things which the Lord had commanded him. So what we have here in this um, commissioning uh, portrait a variety of elements. We have the menorah. We have Aaron. Can you see Aaron there? We have birds. And we have especially the people. The people, un unsurprisingly in this, but we'll see this again, are seen as um, innocent, are seen as expectant. These are the people from his hometown in the Teps as Moses is about to deliver the Ten Commandments. And you notice that the birds, Aaron with his, with his hands, even the people's orientation, all point to the Ten Commandments, which are seen as, uh, in a way, some of the lifeblood of the people. Here we have Exodus chapter 30, uh, the quote is, Thou shalt also anoint Aaron and his sons, and shall consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's offices. So here we have Aaron and the various uh, ritual items uh, that d define his, his office, the mitre, the candelabra, and so on. Notice how Chagall has positioned Aaron with his head tilted as if in humility, in some devotion and dedication, with a look of intensity on his face, and the variety of colors which, which, with which he brings out this, uh, what this experience connotes. Here in the 16th uh, lithograph, we have a quote from the 31st chapter of the book of Exodus. He gave him two tablets of the testimony, 
even the tables of stone written with the finger of God. So here we have an angel presenting this set of tablets to Moses. Chagall, I think, has created a sense of mystery by representing this figure non-representationally. This figure has two faces, which I think suggests something imponderable about this experience. Handing Moses the tablets, which Moses receives gladly. Here we have again the people in their innocence ready to, um, ready to accept these commandments. We have here an example of the rays or the horns of Moses, and I want to say something about this. Famously, St. Jerome, in something like 420 of the Common Era, translated the Bible into Latin. It wasn't the first time. There is a previous source called the Old Latin, but Jerome used not an intermediate translation, but the Hebrew veritas, as he said, the Hebrew text itself. And when he got to the verse in chapter 34 of Exodus, where Moses comes down from a uh, uh, conversation with God, after God gives him the second set of tablets after Moses had broken the first set, the Torah says something like, and Moses came, came down and his face, Karan. Karan means either rays or horns. If we were to go to the song of um, Hannah, Hannah, as she was praying for a son, she uses the word Karen, Karen is the noun, Karan is the verb, to represent power, to represent majesty, to represent triumph. So one interpretation of this could be either that the tradition initiated by Jerome sees that word as representing horns, and here are the horns, and very famously, as many of you know, Michelangelo, when he was creating the monumental statue for the tomb of Pope Julius II, put horns on Moses. Was this a result in Michelangelo's hands of a misunderstanding of the word Karen? Or was Michelangelo trying to express something about power, triumph, majesty? Okay, so here it has some ambiguity, it seems to me. It could be horns, but it could also, because these horns overlap the tablets, the Ten Commandments, that it also represents something about a connection with the divine. These horns face up and they're pointing to this particular moment. So it strikes me that Chagall may have had different understandings of the horns in mind, of, of, the, of these objects, at some point pointing to transcendence and connection and perhaps power and majesty, and sometimes, as we might want to say, reflecting Jerome's misinterpretation uh, of this particular passage. Uh, so um, the, the, the other idea here, it seems to me, and I've pointed to this uh, earlier in my, in my introductory <laughs> remarks, that Chagall is also a kind of universalist and he's trying to understand something about the human condition through the various aspects of his art. And perhaps through this, he wants to indicate something about the way in which human beings can relate to the 
higher, higher purposes and higher values. So it may be that Chagall, who admired, he said he admired what Michelangelo did, is trying to reach beyond, let's call it the parochial aspects of biblical translation to something broader. I don't know what you will think about that. Anybody have some comments about that at this point? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking back at number 13 and I'm trying to make the comparison. <laughs> so I can't help but look at that and think he looks a little demonic. I mean, yeah, it's just yeah, the way yeah. the beard is and everything right. else. So if the message is about power and majesty, it seems like it's also kind of an interpretation that sometimes majesty is a little evil. Okay. I don't know. It's just it's more of how I see it. And very interesting. That's a, that's a great comment. So the idea of power, we might say, is value neutral. It can be expressed for good purposes and for malevolent purposes. I tend to see this as Moses' ire against the uh, Amalekites and his determination to commission Joshua, who, after all, will take over for Moses when Moses dies and lead the people into the promised land in the book of Joshua. So I think it's, it's an interesting point here that perhaps this uh, uh, casts the horns in a somewhat negative light, majesty negatively expressed. Yeah. Um, I've, in my own self-study that I've been doing recently on Chagall's art, I find that he's often combining Jewish symbols and Christian symbols in the same work of art right. in many ways. And so I'm, I'm wondering if that's uh, what he's doing here. Um, when I look at these horns or rays, I'm seeing rays of light, but he's really clearly emphasizing this thing throughout the series. And so maybe that's another way that he's combining the Christian and the Jewish elements. Right, 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 right. And I, I pointed out at the beginning that in his uh, the town in which he grew up, almost half the population were Christians, and so this may be another kind of uh, beginning uh, of his affection for humanity in, uh, in general. Yeah. Um, he said he admired Michelangelo, so he saw what he had done. Did he ever refer to them either way, as rays or horns? You know, no. I, don't, I don't know. Anybody know? Margie? I don't know that. I feel like one, one way to look at it is it's an homage to Michelangelo that he puts into it because, because the way Michelangelo sculpted David and, um, and Moses just became iconic. And it's clearly Chagall had to know it was a mistranslation. I'd be surprised if people didn't know that. It also okay. Like Michelangelo, as, if I can remember, were a little more horn like. Like these are maybe of candles, sort of. Mm. Like so, they seem more ray-like than horn-like. Okay. If that matters. Okay. But um, yeah, they just feel different. It it strikes me that when these uh, elements, horns, rays, point beyond them, that it does connote other kinds of meanings. There are some of the renderings where the horns, here, here they are again. Over, over here, I hate to have you uh, turn, but it does seem to me in one of these, this one right here. This is the only lithograph which features one of the plagues. It's the plague of darkness. And here the horns end, they're, they're limited. So it seems to me that this might be an example of um, uh, horns that are not to be understood as rays, but to be understood as something else. Other comments? OK, so um, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, move on here. So uh, where are we? OK. So here we have the golden calf incident. And here's the quote from uh, Exodus 32. Then all the people plucked from themselves the golden earrings, and they brought them into Aaron and received them at their hands. 
and fashioned it and made of it a molten calf. And before I talk about this picture, let me just read to you some excerpts from the golden calf incident in the Torah itself. So this is uh, Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered against Aaron and said to him, come make us a god who shall go before us. For that man Moses who brought us from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron said to them, take off the gold rings that are on your ears of your wives, your sons, and bring them to me. Skipping a little bit. The look, so the scene is the people are down below and Moses is up on the mountain with God. And here is Moses and God. The Lord spoke to Moses, hurry down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted basely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I enjoined upon them. They have made themselves a molten calf and bowed low to it and sacrificed to it, saying, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord further said to Moses, I see that this is a stiff-necked people. As I'm reading this, think about if you, if you can discern it from where you're sitting the way in which it may reflect or not reflect the mood of what is happening here in the biblical story. I see that this is a stiff-necked people. Now let me be that my anger may blaze forth against them and that I may destroy them and make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord saying, let not your anger, O Lord, blaze forth against your people whom you delivered from the land of Egypt with a, mighty, with a mighty hand. Skipping a bit. After Moses has mollified God, if you remember this story, God is angry. He is ready to destroy the people. Start again with Moses. Moses, you're going to be the new Abraham. And Moses talks God out of it. It's one of the great moments in biblical literature. Moses doesn't just say, what are you doing destroying this people? Moses gives God arguments. What, for example, will the Egyptians say when you've destroyed this people, that you brought them out in the wilderness only to destroy them? Is that the reputation you want to trail you now forever? And what about the promises you made to the patriarchs? Are you going to renege on your promises as a model to your people for how to deal with promises? And God finally says, says he doesn't say it the way I'm about to say it, I give up. <laughs> You're right. Now, what is fascinating about what ensues is that Think about Moses' psych psychological uh, condition at this moment. He has expended all of the energy he has to mount arguments against God. Now he's exhausted, but having mollified God, he has to go down and deal with the people. And here's what he does. Thereupon Moses turned and went down from the mountain, bearing the two tablets of the pact. Tablets inscribed on both their surfaces, they were inscribed. The tablets were God's work. When Joshua heard the sound of the people in its boisterousness, he said to Moses, there is a cry of war in the camp. But he answered, it is not the sound of the tune of triumph or the sound of the tune of defeat. It is the sound of song that I hear. As soon as Moses came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, he became enraged. And he hurled the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it. He ground it to powder and strewed it upon the water and so made the Israelites drink it. Moses then turned to Aaron. What did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? 
What did they do to you that you have brought this sin to light in their actions? And Aaron said, let not my Lord be enraged. You know that this people is bent on evil. In other words, look, look, Moses, uh, what do you expect of this people? They're evil from the beginning, and uh, this is how they act. And they said to me, make us a God to lead us. For that man Moses who brought us from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. They gave it to me. I hurled it into the fire. And now I'm going to uh, embellish a little bit. And to my great surprise, out came a calf. I didn't mean to do this at all. It's all, of, it's all their fault. Moses saw that the people were out of control. Okay, So let's look at the Chagall rendering of this scene. Here's the calf in two different colors, red and yellow. Here are the people below. The calf is on the pedestal. And the people are doing what? They're celebrating. They're dancing. Does it look like an evil group of Israelites? Have they engaged here in idolatry? Chagall sees them as celebrating, as innocent, as the common folk who have an opportunity to have a kind of party. And here is this calf sitting here, and um, the people are depicted in different colors. So Chagall resists, strenuously resists, the story indicated in the book of Exodus, which, when you think about the golden calf incident, it really points to this radical disjunction between getting it right and getting it wrong. And as we read the story of the wilderness wandering, we see that the people get it wrong over and over again until finally God says, this generation is too impure in to go into the promised land. We have to wait until it dies out. And a new generation that didn't know slavery and didn't know actions like the Golden Cap incident in its purity can go into the promised land. In other words, I don't know whether you've ever thought about this. The trip between Egypt and Israel is a couple of weeks walk. How did the 40 years come about? It, didn't, it wasn't part of God's plan initially. It only occurred to God when God saw how obdurate, recalcitrant, unable to learn something that isn't tinted with slavery, slave mentality, ready to get into the promised land. This depiction of the golden calf as an episode in itself but also as a kind of model for the way in which the people operate, knows nothing of the kind of obduracy, blindness, moral blindness, that the Bible itself represents. These are Chagall's people from the town of Vitebsk and a people that he loves and wants to depict in a positive or at least a, a way that is innocent of some of the depredations of uh, human nature. I, st I, I think of this particular lithograph as a uh, kind of paradigm for Chagall's uh, understanding of the people that he is uh, depicting. This is a very radical interpretation, isn't it, of the book of Exodus? that doesn't know some of these very stark oppositions. Margie? Well, I like that it's as if Chagall understands the people far better than Moses. You know, it's worth mentioning that the cow was Hathor, one of the major deities in ancient Egypt, uh -huh. they would have known, and that they would have, if they weren't, they couldn't really recreate the sun god, but they could recreate Hathor. And, and Moses disappears on them for long stretches, yeah. leaderless. So it's sort of like Chagall gets it. Moses doesn't. 
That's a, that's a good point. Chagall understands it more than, uh, than Moses does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's an interesting midrash. Uh, it says when Moses failed to come down, I don't remember how the Torah says it, uh, it's as if Moses had said to them, I'll be back 40 days from now. He leaves at 6 o'clock in the evening. And they expect in their literalness that he's coming back at 6 o'clock. When he delayed, it's now 10 after 6. Uh, they think that Moses has abandoned them. That's the Torah, not Chagall. Yeah, Ellen? If, um, if Chagall felt free to interpret this on the people's behalf rather than find them evil, why didn't he leave off the horns, which Christians <coughs> interpret as evil? I know I had... Uh, girls in um, at Ohio State in mm -hmm. from a small town saved me where I'm at home. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, several people have had that experience. Roommates in college, I thought you uh, had horns. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that, except that it was taken up by a tradition as a sign of evil as a sign of animality and so on. Not that necessarily the, 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 the impetus for using these symbols was to, if you think of it as majesty or you think of it as a connection between heaven and earth, uh, then it doesn't have that negative valence. So I, I suppose one could say that different traditions understand these symbols differently. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm just looking at the quote unquote calf, and it looks more like a horse or a donkey or a oh. man to me. I'm curious if you have that image. Why it wouldn't look like a calf? You know, I don't know. Any thoughts about that? Absolutely. There you go. Non representational, representational art. <laughs> It's true that Chagall is, a, at least here, a representational artist. Uh, but he often, as, as with the angel here, two faces shadowed by, a, by an animal. So he's problematizing representation. Yes? Isn't there a thing sort of throughout Exodus whether Moses is man or God? Because the Israelites say this man who is yeah. God, and yet it's Moses who doesn't want to be, who doesn't want to be the God, all right. And we find out later on he's not, you know, we can't find his grave because we don't want to make him a God. But there's this this theme throughout, and yet in this in this art uh, we we go sort of back toward maybe he's one, maybe he's a little more than just man. That's that's an interesting point. Uh, I don't know Moses and God, but certainly Moses as a very austere figure. And I think your point about Moses' burial, uh, that we don't know because of the tendency to divinize um, human beings and to, and to have the, uh, the grave as a kind of shrine to which to visit. That's an interesting thought. Okay, any thoughts, Cindy? Back to the cat. Isn't the red heifer in Jewish liturgy something very special? And he paints the cat partly red. Oh, good. It's interesting. Yeah, the red heifer, I think in Numbers 19, is used by the tradition as a way to purify the altar. And so if you have a pure heifer with no red hairs, I think, at all, then it can be sacrificed and its blood poured on the altar, which then sanctifies it. And even today, uh, a, a certain group of Orthodox Jews in Israel are growing heifers in order to f finally get a red heifer to finally purify the, the altar. So you, you think that maybe the red here, it signifies just that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What would that mean, I wonder? Yeah. The dichotomy between good and evil. Evil is, you know, the gold is the, the gold is our, 
Okay, so, uh, very what way? Ironic. I, ironic. Ironic in what sense? Evil, good? Duality. Uh, duality here. That's interesting. What would the, so the evil would be the Torah's interpretation. The good would be, hey, this is a party. This is a way of just uh, celebrating life in the wilderness. I, I kind of like that. Con contrary colors. All right, let's move here to chapter 32. This is where Moses throws down the tablets. Let me read you the passage. Moses' wrath waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them in pieces beneath the mountain. Okay? So Moses is angry, and he smashes the tablets, and the people are horrified. What, what about this depiction of that moment? It looks, it looks to me that Moses merely has dropped the tablets. He doesn't seem angry. He, in a way, he seems surprised at what has transpired. Maybe coming down the mountain, uh, he slips and the tablets fall, and it surprises him the people, I don't know what to make of them. Uh, they don't look, I mean, the, the reason why Moses smashes the tablets is that the, he sees that the people have engaged in idolatry. This doesn't look like a group of people engage, having engaged in idolatry. So don't you think that Moses takes all of the negative, I mean, Chagall, takes all the negative energy out of that episode and makes it as a kind of accident? What do you think about that? The little guy who eats him next to his bread, it's anger, so maybe that's it. And here he's holding the scroll. I don't know exactly why, um, with wings, and maybe the red is anger. Yeah. Let's go on to, uh, on to the next one. So here, from chapter 34, he, Moses, wrote the tablets, wrote in the tablets the words of the covenant, even the Ten Commandments. So you remember that the first giving of the tablets, Moses goes up and gets them and brings them back. Here, after smashing, God says to him in chapter 34, you, carve, you create the tablets, and I will write on them as a moment of reconciliation. So chapters 32, 33, and 34 are really a mini narrative from idolatry and evil to Moses talking God back into, I put it this way, Moses talking God back into the project. <laughs> um, because God has uh, abdicated, God has left the scene. He says to Moses, I'd really like you to be the new Abraham. Moses says no and talks God back into it. And here Moses is um, embracing the second set of tablets. There is a, a, a deep affection here, isn't there, between Moses and these tablets? What is strange about it to me is that there's only one Hebrew word rendered, and it's the same word rendered one, two, three, four, five times. And I'm sorry? No, no, no. Yeah, that's the word lo, lo terzach, don't, don't do something. So that even though there is tenderness here and a sense of affection, maybe even gratitude for now having these tablets again, the life source of the people, the word that's intimated over and over is negative. Anybody make something of this? Well, the negative stuff's on the left side. It's a fluctuating book. Right. That, that is true. The negative, if you think of, the Torah doesn't tell us how those commandments are arrayed on the tablets. And the Jewish tradition has several different ways of doing it all of them on one side, all of them on another, one scholar suggests. And what you're suggesting is it's true that 
not all the negatives are on the second tablet. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. But most of them are on the second. But they're rendered here on both as if, uh, in, in some way, Chagall wants to indicate that the pervasive mood here has something to do with don't, with negativity and not positive. Well, Moses and Chagall are both pragmatic. Chagall knows the people. He knows the people need laws in order to, okay. you know, even, even in his community, if you love his community, they needed laws. Yeah. So I think they're just both being really pragmatic at the time. That's a nice interpretation. It's as if Moses doesn't expect the people to be purer than they are. He loves them, but knows what they need. Nice, I like that. Jim? Well, man-made tablets are just that, man-made. So they can't be perfect like the original divine set. Uh -huh. And therefore, I think looking at Chagall's perspective rather than the narrative the Bible pushes, um, he's undermining the fact that Man can't get it perfect. Mm. Only God can. Interesting. So that the low, the no, don't suggests limitation, weakness, imperfection. I like that, Vivian. What strikes me um, about that image by the size of his hand, that the Torah is in the hands of man, and those are where the words have come to be. What, what I think well, I'm just saying the hand of man is also on those tablets, mm -hmm. and that's where the power of the words lives in the hands. Of, I see. I don't know. I'm just being as abstract as that. No, no, no. I, I, I like but that. But the hands are, are a big part of that image. They really are. When you think about the proportionality here, the hands yeah. are quite big. So for you, I mean, in a way, you're echoing Jim's comment yeah. that this is, represents the human quality of what is either on the tablets or what we can make of them. What gives the tablets life are the hands of man. They sit there inert. The of God uh -huh. in the hands of man. Nice, nice, nice. They, they are the words of God. But it's human beings who give them life. And they're not that they're invisible on that on the, that image, so mm. show, or they're just coming about. Yeah. I don't know. I like it. I like it. I like it. Notice Moses's face here, filled with uh, different colors, as if to bring out something of the complexity of who Moses is. Maybe that's a little too philosophical. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Nancy? What's the connection between the angel bringing the Torah scroll in 32.19 and Moses here? Is that to imply that Moses knows the words of God because he's been given this angelic vision, or is there no connection? So, uh, what, so you're making a, a, a comparison between this and, no. aren't you? The angel coming down with the Taurus scroll. No, no. Over two. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. That angel. Yes. That angel was supposedly bringing the Taurus scroll wrapped in royal garments. Okay. And does that imply that somehow royalty is coming to the people? Does that imply that that's those are the words that Moses will guess? Or is there no connection? I'm, not, I'm just not following you. Say it again. Because of the way it's painted, yes, with the angel coming toward Moses, right, but not having reached him. Okay, is there something we can imply, something missing between that and the fact that Moses had carved mm -hmm. with his own hand? What would what would you think is? Do you have any speculation about what's missing? Receptivity. 
either, it could go either way for me, either that the angel inspired Moses so he knew how to write, even, even while he was throwing the tablet down, or there's no connection, and as people have noted, it's a human. Aha. Aha. This can be understood as t totally human and not this connection here between above and below. Otherwise, I don't know why the angel, why Chaval saw the angel. Right, 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 right. Is the angel being sort of like he just threw the tablets down? So the angel be like, ah, like, uh, you know, like a reminder? Okay. Like, sort of rough. Interesting. So this is action interrupted. This is the action completed. Something like that. A, a, a warning. The the red is significant in your interpretation. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Jim. Well, so you talked about it as kind of a progression of Chagall telling a story. So when you ask why the words might be on that one, I saw it as before it was God having a conversation with Moses about the way to help guide people. When Moses comes down, he sees the celebration, he sees it all for what it is, and then has that it's like almost coming home to your kids having a party at the house. Then he's having a serious conversation with the kids. And it's the sharing of the commandments where it's really emphasizing the things that they shouldn't be doing. Oh, that's interesting. Being... <laughs> You're suggesting a kind of narrative line here. Yeah. yeah. No, at least there's a consistency, at least trying to maintain a the theme. I think that so many of our interpretations of this find this portrait a, a culminating moment here. Tension and finally embraced with warning, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah. Was the same Lynn? thing written on the tablets? The Say first, that again. Was the same, I should, everybody probably knows this, but was the same thing written on the tablets when God wrote it versus what was written? When I, I don't believe the Torah tells us how the commandments were written, how they were arrayed originally. And, originally. And, and this leaves our tradition to, uh, to uh, interpret it in a variety of ways. Uh, there are two givings of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5. And one way of seeing that is different ways in which they were arrayed on the uh, tablets themselves. Arrayed with the same information. Yes, although De the Deuteronomic uh, rendering has some differences. Um, certainly in terms of the Shabbat commandment. One is remember creation, the other is remember to remember the exodus from Egypt. I think exodus has the creation and, and so on. So there are some variations. All right, let's, uh, let's go on here. Exodus chapter 35, then Moses assembled all the congregation of the children of Israel and said to them, these are the words which the Lord has commanded that you shall do them. Um, I think this is a very interesting uh, one. I mean, after all, it's, Moses is kind of floating, isn't he? He doesn't seem to be grounded. So this gives a, uh, the, 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 the aura of something mystical, something magical. In a way, it's a, a non-representational way of representing. Nick, I have a question. In, in, uh, somewhere along into this timeline, Moses' face becomes unlookable. Uh -huh. You know, he, he has this glow. Right. And, he, and, and can, you, can you tell me at what point it becomes this face that you cannot no longer look at and he basically goes into seclusion. If it is at that moment, that may um, mm. you know, mm. kind of imply a higher being of sense. But if it, if it had started there, uh. then it might have implied the rays, the horns, you know, the, the rays. The higher being in the sense of floating and not grounded. At well, clearly, Chagall wasn't going to take his face away. He wasn't going to try to represent Moses as uh, a being that you could no longer look at. 
Right, right, right. And that happens at the end of the second giving of the tablets. At the so Moses' face was glowing so much that he had to cover it with a veil. So in a sense, you know, he is a different being. Okay. Okay. That, in a way, is different from Joe's interpretation, which is, let's not make Moses into a divinity, which the people may be doing. And you're suggesting that here, he hovers, so to speak, as somehow transcendent or different. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. it's just implied that you can no longer look upon his face. Don't you think another way of looking at this, not necessarily in, in a, 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 not what you're suggesting, but there's a playfulness here, isn't there? Uh, the people are rejoicing, the tablets, the bird, Moses, the pride on Moses' face that he's not grounded. It's a playful picture. Would you agree with that? He must yeah. know the of Moab being held over the people and they're, you know, they're being threatened by the commandments as opposed to this is the joyous. Uh, I didn't accept it. Just... That's an interesting point. There is that midrash where God says to the people, I'm offering you these tablets, take them or else. Either you'll accept them or the mountain, I can't remember exactly how it goes, the mountain will bury you. So the kind of threat as opposed to the happy rejoicing acceptance of them. I think it comes from the words under the mountain. He presented them from under the mountain. Okay, very good. They were under the mountain, so the under could be low or could be mountain cellular. Nice. Yeah, very good. Please, Lynn. So that one and that one are like mirror images? This, this one and which one? And that one. Yes. They're mirror images. In what sense? They're the same view, but the first time and then the final, the second time. Mm -hmm. The same rock. Like this, I see it more as like a rock that he's kneeling on, so like an altar. Uh, uh, oh, interesting. Grounded for Grounded, sure. And then they've done the same rock as in this image, and the people are in the same spot. Mm -hmm. It's just like he's coming from different sides. And the blue, there it's an angel, here it's a bird. So to me, there, there's something about the sort of they're the two reflections of each other. And what would you, could you say something more? Uh, I think that, I was almost wondering if there he needed help or if there he was just like the angel and then the bird and then the angel and then the bird and then the bird and then the the blue bird or whatever is more in a support role because it's going well. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's hard to tell the expression on the face or people's faces, but um, it's, uh, yeah. It's here, here is more dependence and there is more independence or yeah, crisis and resolution. It's interesting. I hadn't noticed that. And here are their mirror images of one another, aren't they? This is the trajectory and there it's, yeah, good. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, take, a, take a look at the next one here. Which one is that? Exodus 37, but Salel, uh, who creates uh, the, the, uh, the tabernacle, made the two Keruvim, the cherubim, the, those uh, hybrid figures uh, with wings. You remember the Keruvim and the Holy of Holies spread their wings out and create a space for the divine throne above the ark. So Betzalel made the two Keruvim of gold and the Keruvim spread out their wings, their faces were toward one another and he made the candlestick of pure gold. So here evidently is Aaron being celebrated. Here is God's name and the candelabra and so on. Is that Aaron? Maybe it is. So. Uh, very very uh, uh, wonderfully no colorful. I'm sorry? Is that Aaron over there? Going good all the rest yeah, that's true. So who could that be? You think that might be Betzalel himself, yeah. mm, the architect. He has tools in his hands, doesn't he? He what? Does he have tools in his hands? Looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. What would that be for? 
For, for crafts, yeah, making. And this is a very happy picture, isn't it? So in a way, it can be seen as a mode of the celebration of the ritual life of the people, to which the book of Exodus gives a great deal of attention. I mean, almost uh, half, uh, so the book of uh, Exodus has 40 chapters. The building of the, of the uh, Mishkan, the tabernacle, begins in chapter 25, and really takes the entire rest of the Bible. The instructions are given for six chapters, and then golden calf, and then those instructions are carried out uh, in the last six or seven chapters. Matter of fact, in Rashi's commentary, the last six or seven chapters of Exodus has almost no commentary at all because it's merely what is potential in chapters 25 to 31 becomes implemented in 35. So here in a, in a certain way is a celebration of one of the chief emphases of the book of Exodus. And that is the way in which ritual creates and sustains a durable community, the community in action. Katya? You don't want to miss this after and take a closer look at Bezalel. You will see portrait portrait of Mark Chagall. Oh. This is the artist. This one right here? Yes, this is the artist. Right here, you mean? No. Oh, well, the Bezalel himself. Look at his face. That's an interesting. Look at ah. his face. It's Mark Chagall himself. Oh, that is very, very interesting. <laughs> and notice that one eye is off the face. So this, in a way, is a tribute to cubism, isn't it? Looking at one object from two different angles. Here is a side look, but here is a frontal look, the two eyes. So is Chagall also working with some of the genres of modern, of modern art. Uh, let's just take a look here. Exodus chapter 39. Moreover, they made garments of ministration to minister in the sanctuary. They made also the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded. So Moses and Aaron, notice over there when, you remember at the very beginning of the story, Moses meets Aaron. God says, go back, Aaron is waiting for you, and you are going to both go to the Pharaoh. And here, in a lovely depiction, Moses, with his hand out, is describing to Aaron what the, what the project is going to be. They're facing one another, Moses is animated, Aaron is listening intently. Over here, I don't know exactly what to make of it, they're facing different directions. Moses one way, Aaron another. They're together, but they don't seem to be, I don't know what the, what the word is, a harmonious, cooperating on the same track. Um, it looks to me as if here, here they're working together to go to Pharaoh. Here at the end of the story, they may, in the intensity of their gazes, focused on their vocation. And the vocations are different. Um, Moses is a prophet. Aaron is a priest. The prophets often speak against the people. Aaron said at the Golden Calf incident, what do you expect? The people are weak. There's a sense of intimacy, of acceptance on the part of the priest. So maybe this points to, although it wouldn't seem to be quite consistent with Chagall's outlook, a sense of uh, alienation of two different vocations, though they're both going forward together. Moses holding the tablets, Aaron involved in the ritual. Here are the, uh, the horns again. Uh, they kind of dissolve into uh, non definition here, which may indicate something ethereal going on. Any, any thoughts about it, Margie? The expressions 
are so different. They, it almost feels like Moses is a different species there. Yeah. And his look, is, it's got innocence, it's got calmness. He looks a little stoned in the action. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but Aaron has such a, like an everyday person. Yeah. It's a real contrast. There really is, yeah. And there's darkness here. I mean, the, 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 uh, the background of the picture is quite dark, unlike so many of them, very similar to the one plague in that, uh, in that portrait over there. Yeah, any other thoughts about this, Jim? Okay, so I see it very differently. So where the two of them are there and they're talking and Aaron's listening and it's almost as if the teacher is guiding the student. As they come here, I don't see any animosity or I don't interpret any of that. I see it more as the work of the prophet leads to some place that we don't know yet. And when the work, they, they have their jobs to do and that they're ready to go and face them. I like that a lot. He's looking off into the not yet, whereas Aaron is facing the people. But they're still together, their mission is to life. Okay, very good. In a way, their, their bodies overlap a bit as if there is some, some harmony of spirit. Yeah, that's especially powerful, isn't it? And then let's look here at the second to the last one. What is this? Where am I? Um, chapter 39, and Moses beheld all the work and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, and Moses blessed them. You know, um, uh, one way of looking at the end of the book of Exodus is that it's parallel with the end of the creation story in Genesis. Look at the, uh, at the, at the language here. And Moses beheld all the work, and God saw all that he had done, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, and Moses blessed them, and God blessed them. So then in a certain way, the Torah is, is a, creates a kind of envelope uh, between the beginning of Genesis and the, be and the end of Exodus, as if two creations had taken place. The creation of the world by God, the creation of the tabernacle by the people, as if the tabernacle is a kind of world of its own. So two creations at the beginning, at the end, with human beings now emulating God's creative act. And you can see here that Moses is blessing the people and the work, supported by, encouraged by, a divine figure which strikes me as a way of bringing Genesis and Exodus together. That uh, here, heaven and earth are working together. And in a way, there's no great separation between heaven and earth. Uh, in, in, in a way, they can interpenetrate here. Um, in, in a, so this is Moses blessing and supported quite movingly, it seems to me by a very satisfied looking angel. Don't you think that's a beautiful depiction, Joe? No, I don't want to, that's a great thought. I don't want to give you thoughts. I don't want to, my thought was, it's interesting because we've already, got, we've already got a priestly class here, and yet Moses blessed them. So again, he's switching back to, because he's, by this time, he's a lawgiver. He throws tells me he's a lawgiver and a storyteller, yeah. Moshe Rabbeinu. Yes. The, the, the teacher, yes. yet he's blessing them. Where you think by well, this kind of blessings would come from the priest, from Aaron's line. You make anything of that? No, I just. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Neither do I. Maybe a kind of synthesis of their, 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 their taking in the role of the other in a, in a gesture of cooperation. Don't know. Don't know. What do we make of that glow in the back? This. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly a city or a walled city. 
I don't know. Any thoughts about it? I hadn't noticed it, really. Sunrise or Yeah, maybe Shabbat. Uh-huh. Or maybe that since the tabernacle is the work of human hands, and the work of human hands is civilization, that this represents civilization. In a way, it's parallel to, or a, uh, on the macrocosmic level of what the tabernacle is microcosmically. I don't know. I don't know. And finally, we have this climactic um, uh, lithograph, chapter 40, 38, right at the end. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle. The cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night, so this is day, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. So, um, cloud, tablets, parallel, Moses, divine figure, parallel, so I think this represents the harmony of heaven and earth. God's protection of the people, the tablet's protection of the people, law, uh, the, the orderliness of the human world. But on the same plane, this is not heaven way above and earth way below. In a way, they interpenetrate one another. The, 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 two, the two instruments of well-being and the two uh, uh, creators of those instruments. Now, not Moses didn't create it, but he's now in, in charge of it. The, 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 El, the God and human beings. And so it's wonderfully uh, synthetic as the people stand innocently ready to accept and embrace I think it's a, it's a wonderful climactic lithograph which shows this uh, you know, combination of heaven and earth, human and divine roles. Thoughts, Ellen? Could you speak to uh, more the universality that maybe, maybe God is still overlooking to people? Nice, like it. So in other words, this is not only the conclusion of this set or of the book, but also prologue to what is about to follow. This is the world that we now inhabit, where heaven and earth interpenetrate Moses and divine, human and divine, different signs. I like that, I like that. The, the book of Exodus leads on to what follows. Any other thoughts? Okay, well, look, I mean, these are powerful, powerful lithographs, and uh, how long are they going to be up, Katya? How long is this exhibit going to be up? Right, so this exhibit is going to be, uh, it is done in Israel, so it's going to be done in the middle of March. Oh, good. So it's going to be done in the middle of March, and hopefully next month I'm going to change the uh, company object a little bit so that we can also see the connection between the more folkloristic Judaica and the visual language of a little bit more difficult folkloristic objects and how Chagall's visual uh, formulation relates to other Judaica objects. So Excellent. Excellent. keep that in mind, and we obviously get to talk about this as well. Okay, thanks so much for coming. Thank